Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? And now for something completely different. We're going to look at one of the later spinoffs for Extreme Studios. This is going to be Blood Pool number one. So just before we get into it, if you enjoy the channel, if you feel like you might want to help out a little bit, go and subscribe on my Patreon. Gives you early access to everything I do. Helps out the channel. Helps to buy new comics. So Blood Pool is one of those comics I never heard of back in the day. I think you can probably rank it up there with things like New Men, Berserkers, Dooms 4. I think we'd all seen the ads, but I'd never gotten confirmation that an actual issue had been released. And Bloodpool is one of those extreme books that has a decent premise. Um, there's a few of them, really. Uh, one thing that Rob is good at, maybe the only thing in terms of writing, is coming up with a concept. He comes up with a couple of decent ones. Now, it's usually the very bare bones of a concept. And it's up to somebody else to flesh that out. And if he doesn't have that person, then that's all you got, right? I mean, that's kind of what Bloodstrike ended up being. Or Youngblood, for that matter. I mean, you know, the concept for Youngblood isn't bad. It's kind of interesting. And in 1992, it was fairly fresh. So the deal with Bloodpool is that it's Youngblood's training program. And I get the impression that at first, maybe Rob Liefeld thought of this as like a New Mutants kind of book. And then he just ended up letting it sit forever. And then he got the idea of what if that training program got their funding cut? And you've got these like mostly trained superheroes who just get shoved out on the street. That's not a bad place to start. I mean, it is just the very basic conception of an idea. And you have to have somebody expand on that quite a bit. But, you know, hey, that's something. And that, I mean, that might be more than stuff like Spawn or Shadowhawk had. Or Brigade, for that matter. But then Brigade doesn't really count the same way, does it? So this is going to be drawn by Pat Lee, a very young Pat Lee. Uh, at this point, he is 20 years old, as far as I can do the math. And written by Joe Duffy. So longtime comic writing vet. Joe Duffy got her start in comics in the 70s. I, I think her first book was on Star Wars, and she got a bit of a lengthy run on that. So we've got somebody who has some actual writing experience at the helm on this one. And I think we've already seen, sometimes that works, sometimes, eh, not so much. Sometimes the extremeness kind of takes over. So we'll have to see how that goes. So let's get started on the cover on this. Uh, this is a little representative of what we're going to get in the issue. So for a 20-year-old dude, Pat Lee is pretty fucking good. There's elements of his style that still very much need to be ironed out. But, um, no, he's, uh, he's definitely way further along than a lot of the people at extreme at this time so we can see here uh pat lee gets some influences there's some manga influence although it's a little less apparent here it would become more so after a few years uh there's also like a little bit of a joe mad influence you can see in some of the faces here and but um but no, he's already worked out a whole bunch of the kinks in his style uh one of the things he hasn't figured out yet is that his finished pieces tend to be too busy there's not a lot of differentiation in the lines, although that could be partially down to the inker. And it doesn't help that this is 1995, and we've just discovered computer colors, and oh boy, are we excited about it. Everything here looks like it's been sculpted out of some kind of high-gloss rubber, and it's very easy to lose track of anything that's going on on any particular page. Like, did you notice the rock guy here? Probably not, right? And I'm not entirely sure who to blame on that. Um, I think it's probably 50-50 between Pat Lee and the colors. But that being said, I mean, it's not a terrible cover. Eh, it, the busyness really does make it like almost impossible to call this a good cover. Like if you saw this on the shelf, your eye would probably skate right over it because you couldn't lock on to anything. Okay, so yeah, Joe Duffy, Patrick Lee, also doing the colors on this. Ah, so you get 100% of the blame. Okay, good to know. Inker, Jaime Mendoza. I don't notice a whole lot here, although some of these lines don't look too bad. I mean, you know, it's not a bad inking job as far as I can tell throughout. So we're going to kick things off here uh, with what I think is probably going to be uh, one of the more prominent characters. This is Rubble. He's got a little bit of a bad rock thing going on, which means he has a little bit of a thing thing going on. But in this case, it's a little bit different. It's, it's more like he's constructed out of shale. And you can see, like, all the bits falling off him all the time. So that's fun. And in this splash, I mean, there's not a whole lot of anything really going on. Just Rubble is upset. He says, this bites, it sucks, it totally blows. But in terms of just a single dude standing against no background, that's pretty good. Everything looks pretty solid. Um, I like what he's doing with the colors on the shadows, actually. Where it's not, like, black underneath, really. It's almost lighter in some ways. Like, it's not a bad look at all, 
Uh, when he stops to think about the shadows, I feel like he doesn't do a bad job, but there won't be a lot of that in this issue. And holy God. Like, you see what I mean about making his pages too busy? I can't tell what the shit is going on for like 80% of this. So anyway, this rubble guy is super upset because they've all gone through the young blood training, the blood pool training. In a lot of cases, they've had some kind of surgical work done on them or genetic work. So, you know, they've all been operated on and experimented on. Some of them are now cyborgs and now they've been given the boot. This is in the wake of Extreme Sacrifice, so spoilers, if you give a shit. Turns out Graves, who was running Youngblood for a while there, was the devil. Oh my god. And he was the one who was backing uh, Bloodpool. So now that he's been destroyed, or whatever the hell happened at the end of Extreme Sacrifice, all of his projects are getting sunk with him. So Bloodpool project it has been defunded. I would think, generally speaking, you know, you'd want to eliminate all of your subjects in that case, but maybe that's a little difficult with superheroes. And yeah, so this rubble guy just keeps ranting, 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 ranting. And the rest of the team just goes, yeah, no, you know, the rest of us are here too. We also kind of got canned, like, you know, maybe dial it down a little bit. It's not all about you. And yeah, from what I can tell, there's some pretty good detail going on back here. I, I think part of it is line weights. There's, it feels like there's nothing separating the figures from the backgrounds. And part of it is no shadows. Like, yeah, there's some going on here, but like nothing in here, nothing in the background has a shadow. Same with on any of this stuff. And since the artist is also the colorist, I mean, you could do a little bit of like diffusion to lessen the intensity of the color in the backgrounds, but he's not doing any of that. You can maybe do like contrasting colors. I don't know. I, I don't know shit about color. I just know that this is a fucking puke fest to look at. So anyway, these are our blood pool guys. It takes them a while to actually go about naming any of them, which I'm not sure if that's on Joe Duffy or if it's on Padley. I get the feeling this has been done Marvel method, and Joe Duffy's just kind of trying to flesh this out and not being particularly successful because I Padley might have like his his figure worked down pretty well. He's worked out quite a bit, but one thing he hasn't figured out is storytelling. Which is understandable. I mean, that's generally one of the last things people do figure out. Or one of the things that takes the longest. Yeah, all this stuff. And, like, all, he had to make the, the borders even more complex than they were. So it, it, just, it just adds to that feeling of just getting drowned in uh, little noodly details. And in this big mass of dudes, he managed to work a stormtrooper in the background here. I wonder if that was for Joe Duffy. All right, so Silence here, who we did see in Youngblood number eight, I think it was, in the group shot. Well, she she was the one who tended to jump around, just showing off multiple crotch shots in the uh, when Rob Liefeld was drawing her. Which reminds me, actually, there is an alternate cover for this by Rob Liefeld, which I also have. I think I was able to get, like, the four-issue miniseries plus the special plus variants for, like, $5 or something. So it's like, eh, why not? I might hit them. And, you know, that's not a good cover either. Oh, yeah, I guess uh, if this is 95, we're not too far off from Heroes Reborn, so that means we're not too far off from Rob's Enchantress, are we? At least he got some detail in on this, like far more than he does these days, so that's something. So, okay, Silence seems to only communicate telepathically, and I think she's trying to calm Rubble down, which this one, I don't remember her name. They say it like maybe once, but she doesn't like Silence. Because, uh, you know, it's a group of pr probably pretty close to teenagers, and they've got to have problems with each other. And this is Task, who also showed up in Youngblood number 8. And he's uh, the one who's trying to be the voice of reason. He's pointing out, Shaft didn't have to come down here to tell us that we were let go. I mean, you know, he, he's kind of doing that to kind of smooth things over. And this is all kind of disjointed. Again, I think it's a Marvel Method thing. I think Joe Duffy isn't sure what to put in these to kind of link them together. Because she starts over going, like, control yourself, Rubble. And the, the other girl, the Molly Ringwald-looking girl, she's like, who does that stuck-up creep think she is? And then this prophet-looking guy who's not prophet is like, now, now, if you haven't... Oh, so Soul says, if you have an opinion, uh, you have don't have to tell us what you think. Just let Dear Silence pull it out of your mind. But it's, it's just like, there's a minute there where I don't even know what... She's trying to do. I don't know what she's complaining about. 
And you got to kind of run through the page once or twice to go, oh, okay, I, I kind of get it. And yeah, so this is Shaft Manga Boots variant. Oh, I wonder if this came out before the Liefeld version of the uh, the Manga Boots. That's a possibility. Yeah, Manga Boots Shaft seems to debut on the cover of Team Youngblood number 19, which is dated for June of 1995. This is an August 95 release. And seeing as how we've never seen Rob draw any of that shit on a character before, yeah, I think it's probably pretty safe to say that was probably a Pat Lee creation. And again, this thing is, oh my god, this is such a mess. There's some decent drawing going on in here. Like, he's got some good stuff going on with the hands. He's trying with the foreshortening. It's not quite right. It look, does look like that left leg is quite a bit smaller than the right leg. But, you know, I, I appreciate the effort. There's some good stuff. He's not far off from being pretty good. But then he messes it all up by putting in too much detail all over the suit so everything starts to kind of blur together. And since he's the one doing the coloring, he makes it. he's the one who makes it look like fucking cherry bubblegum. And then puts all these fucking highlights on everything. Like you can see that there's a pretty good drawing under there somewhere. It's just there's so much stuff layered on top. And Rubble here still wants to yell at Shaft because, you know, he got fired. And there's all sorts of reaction shots going on down here with nobody saying anything. It looks like they should be saying things, but Joe Duffy didn't put any dialogue in there because I guess that wasn't the exchange she had in mind. Or just couldn't think of anything interesting to put in there. Or maybe had a problem with the book. I don't know. Because it's very obvious there should be some kind of exchange between these two characters here. This guy should be saying something. He's not. I don't think he says fucking shit throughout this entire comic. He should be talking here. And it's literally just Rubble and Shaft arguing with each other about how they're getting fired. And this is where things just get downright, I don't know, almost silly. Because they're, they're continually going over the same arguments here. Tass tells Rubble, come on, calm down, he's on our side. And then we cut to the group, who again are obviously talking to each other. And they're literally just saying, pss, 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 pss. And I don't know what the fuck happened there. This feels like Joe Duffy is sabotaging this book. I don't know how you have a problem with a book at number one. And then this whole page is complete and utter fucking nonsense. The possum guy here notices a flower on the ground. There's no mention of the flower anywhere else. So nobody else dropped it like to get his attention or anything. So he picks up the flower and then it disappears. I think it looks like it teleports out. And he's confused and sniffs his hand where it was. And then he looks over, questioningly, and notices tits. And goes, whoa. Like, that seems to be what's happening. And I don't know if Joe Duffy just had a... Maybe she had a problem with the artist. Like, Pat Lee is obviously pretty good. I don't know if he got cocky or something and just kind of rubbed her the wrong way. And she's like, you know, this longtime writer. This is absolutely just making shit up on my own. But, like, there's got to be some kind of explanation for what the fuck is going on. More whispering going on. More shots of the, the, the group. Only, again, nobody's saying fucking shit. There's one word bubble in here going, shh. And there's this guy here who, who looks like he's some kind of leader guy who looks like he's supposed to be piping up. And people are supposed to be taking notice of whatever he's trying to say. It looks like they're supposed to be talking back and forth here. I mean, obviously, she's supposed to be talking to this guy. Like, did they lose the script for those pages or something? This is, I mean, it's very confusing. So we finally get to something recognizable as, like, a narrative as we get back to the argument between Shaft and Rubble. And now Shaft is getting to his point that, you know, being in Youngblood isn't as glamorous as it seems, and there's no guarantee that any of you would have made the cut anyway. And Rubble takes that personally, like, wait a minute, are you saying I wouldn't have made the cut? And he gets infuriated and pulls off his own head because this is part of his power. He's like detachable boy. And tosses his head at Shaft. Um, this stuff looks pretty good. I mean, this panel in particular is kind of great, really. Uh, with the coloring and everything. I'll, I'll give him that. Got some nice underlighting going on here. All sorts of great detail. It doesn't seem like he has a lock on the detail in every situation. But he pulled it off on this one anyway. And I guess he had it in the spotlight here. Must have, right? So yeah, throws his head at Shaft. Task leaps away. 
Shaft pulls out his bow, and Shaft hits the head, like a baseball swing, I imagine. And there's no dialogue. I can I can imagine how this would have looked if Eric Stevenson had scripted this, where it's just text box after text box about how dense Rubble's head is, and about, I don't know, how he's a cocky young superhero, but Shaft is a seasoned veteran uh, with expert reflexes, and in the span of half a second, he's able to calculate the angle and swing with however many pounds of four, you know, like it, it would have gone on and on, right? Uh, Joe Duffy doesn't bother with any of that fucking shit. She's got Tass going, feet don't fail me now, as he runs away. <laughs> oh shit, it actually says Tass up his leggings. It feels like his ass should say juicy on it after that. <laughs> And yeah, the big swing and ooh, there's a few problems in here. There's a lot of problems in here, actually. This hand's no good. This arm's no good. Uh, the flat angle on the profile doesn't look any kind of good. This one's okay. The angle isn't quite right. Yeah, I, yeah. It's interesting to see a guy who like obviously has a lot figured out, but and then you know he has to draw something a little different from what he's used to, and it starts to fall apart. It's just normally, you know. You don't see it put on an actual comic page because by the time they get to a comic page, generally speaking, they've been put through the meat grinder a little bit to the point where they've ironed out like the most egregious of their mistakes. So with the head being hit, we can now re-enter regular speed. That is the thing, right? Like this was two fucking pages of wind up. Anyway, uh, the head goes bouncing around and bounces back towards the group and the possum looking guy doesn't move. And this guy here, they do say he is a possum, by the way. It's not me, like, you know, making shit up. Uh, he's like, hey, Didelphus, why don't you move? And then he gets smacked in the face and gets, I guess, knocked out? Sure. And they all kind of crowd around him, like, why didn't he move? And um, Soul here is like, well, he is kind of a possum, maybe when he got confronted by danger and he just kind of froze. Which would be funny, except he's not one of the characters who's on the group. He's more like support personnel. But that's like a very Suicide Squad kind of uh, character trait, it feels like. Like, you know, the, the James Gunn movie. So yeah, they just kind of leave him on the floor. And I mean, in the meantime, a whole bunch of shit again happened with no dialogue. Barely any... There's not even sound effects on this page. Like, not a single one. Not for the bounces. Not for the hit. It feels like Joe Duffy's given up on this thing. And, okay, so Rubble can't find his head afterwards. So... Shaft goes to help him out. I think he is genuinely trying to help out here. And Rubble doesn't want him touching his head, so bites his fingers. That's kind of a fun little bit, or would be. It's just, it's just, it's just not played like a fun little bit. And from there, we cut to, uh, who knows? It just The caption box just says, and so. So the Blood Pool guys, they're going to be called Blood Pool going forward. That is actually the name of the team. Are going to go loading up all sorts of old Youngblood tech. And this all seems, from the dialogue, like it's carrying over directly from here, except for the and so. Because that makes it feel like time has passed, or and we're at a different location or something. Because he directly re references Rebel's sensitive about who he lets handle his parts. And Tass's like, can you blame him? Next thing you know, they'll realize he's off the team, and they'll decide to keep a couple of pieces, maybe an entire limb, and see if they can make a more cooperative model. And Shaft is like, yeah, I wish I could say that it never happened, but I've seen worse. So, I mean, that's like a real exchange. That's something. So, anyway, yeah. They're loading up all sorts of stuff, and Shaft is continually talking like he isn't seeing them load up all sorts of stuff. This is kind of the, the deal going now where, as like a parting gift, since Shaft feels bad about having to cut them loose, he's going to let them take some old, obsolete Youngblood tech, which seems like a terrible fucking idea, by the way. Like, he offers them a Destroyer 286A, as well as a Plasma Flux Cannon, and a Hyper Infra Scanner, which they've already all picked up. So Shaft says, oh, never mind, and they go, don't blame yourself, the hardware may be vintage, but we get our advice from the best there ever was. I don't know what that means. I don't know what anything means in this. I read this earlier, and I didn't realize just how bad the schism between the art and the writing was, but, like, this thing is unreadable. So, yeah, he sees them off. They kind of load up their, their Jeep here or whatever with all, yeah, just like all sorts of fucking weapons. Like, that seems like a great way to get started as a supervillain. 
is to get shut out of your government-funded superhero experiment group and just get tossed out on the street with, like, a, a bunch of fucking lasers. Anyway, they seem to end on good terms, at least. You know, Tass shakes Shaft's hand at the end. Shaft's like, okay, don't get arrested or killed or anything. Hopefully we'll see you. And then the possum guy, he he also says goodbye, but it, it seems like they don't want anything to do with him. I mean, you know, if he just kind of gets his ass knocked out all the time, I guess I can see why, but... And they drive off, and they get stuck in traffic by the looks of it. And Rubble is going to needle Fusion. That's this guy here, the blonde guy, who looked like he was almost going to talk so many times and then didn't. And he's doing, he's, you know, he's just going to be like, where'd you get your license anyway? Charm school? This thing have AC? You know, all just constant. And then meanwhile, in what looks like an armored Jeep slash Rolls Royce, okie dokie, we've got Mr. Terry Denver, who has recently come into uh, what looks to be probably a fortune. And he's in the Rolls Jeep with his mistress. And they're just kind of driving along in traffic. Then they get cut off by a truck. And they've got to do a big, fast handbrake uh, stop here. I always, you always got to like the, the, the canted turn to show speed. That's always good. And it looks as though the driver uh, was in on this. So this is going to be a kidnapping. So it does make you wonder a little bit why the van needed to stop the Rolls Jeep. Because, I mean, if the driver was in on it, he probably could have just hit the brakes. But whatever. Um, he's like, okay, uh, you're going to come with us. And if you give us any grief, we're going to kill the girl. It's like, okay. And then a uh, blood pool comes out of nowhere and literally runs into the van that stopped the Rolls Jeep. Um, not a very good shot. Like, not a good choice of angle for this. Again, the dude's young. You can let it pass. But it's, it's just, you know... This is just kind of a random panel, really, that feels like it got blown up. So, yeah. Our our team of young heroes who have just been cut loose have magically run across a situation that needs their assistance. This is sometimes what happens when you get a 20-year-old to figure out the layouts of a comic book. Um, so, yeah, they're all just kind of sorting themselves out after the crash. Silence really doesn't say anything of import here uh she says if that man needs diamonds to keep up the interest on his mistress uh he's banking on the wrong kind of love everyone move we have to intervene so okay they all jump into action uh and tell the the terrorists here to let go of the girl that seems to be their focus he says otherwise we're gonna have to hurt you that's an iconic line and uh behind the jeep i think this is oh i think this is wilder um, and so that'd be so, and she's like, do you think they'll listen? And he goes, I hope not. They look stupid. Like this isn't a script. I, I don't know what's going on. Like I know what's going on in the comic. It's extremely evident. I don't know what's going on between the writer and the artist. <laughs> Something is, somebody offended somebody greatly. And, uh, bits of rubble have fallen off. And he's like, I wonder if I can claim this on Fusion's dismemberment insurance. And Silence says, Insurance is for real injuries, not someone looking for a handout. Which is something I've said at work. It doesn't really have a place in this particular conversation, but okay. And yeah, so the uh, the beachhead-looking guys all go, Who are these clowns? And go, we're Bloodpool. And they all start laughing at that, which that that's fine. Could, could be fine. So that fusion guy picks up a spare piece of chrome, tosses it at one of the beachheads, uh, which I guess once it hits him, covers him in more chrome. So that seems to be his power. Um, this is a terrible page. <laughs> like, the, just the layouts and everything. This is uh, submission stuff. This is the kind of thing a 16-year-old puts together when he's going to bring it to a Comic-Con to bring to an editor. Maybe a little better on the finish. But in terms of composition, yeah, fucking terrible. So um, that seems to scare off most of these guys. Uh, Task runs in and does a big old two-page kick. Yeah, there's some weird fucking lines. When they're running away, this one guy yells for his mommy. And so Tass goes, you want your mommy? I'll send you to her. Gift wrapped and autographed. And it's like, damn, nobody ever stole that bar? Shit. I also don't know what he's doing in this panel. He's just kind of flicking. And that seems to have hurt somebody. Who's to say? Again, there are no sound effects anywhere in here. And Soul hits another one. She smacks him. Um, I would guess there's a, a bit of J. Scott Campbell influence going on here as well. That's always a shame when you get your ass stuck on sideways. 
it happens it, particularly in in these comics but you know and then the last one the leader is running down the alley and wilder leaps out and goes want to see your own intestines as he jumps on him and that seems to be it and silence goes definitely not i think that's what she was responding to because she's not responding to uh, the guy i forget his name already who's like i don't know how i can express my my gratitude and then Sewell says, okay, these guys were trying to kidnap you. They attacked you. They were trying to extort you. Like, shouldn't we call the police here? But the mistress brings up, oh, you can't do that, or the wife will find out about all this. And so uh, the guy, I, I still don't remember his name, uh, breaks out his checkbook and says, how would you guys like to work for me? And he says, think of the good your team could do with a properly discreet outlook and enough capital to make heroics your job as well as an adventure. So, yeah, no, he's going to hire them. To do something for him, I guess he's their he's he's their strike force now. Every good millionaire needs a strike force. And we're gonna end with that possum dude walking home from work, I guess. I think he's got his backpack on. And then the team is in the car, all fucking mystery machine style, just like look out world, because here comes blood pool. And that's it. Yeah. Uh, this is just kind of the breakdown for where the idea of the blood pool came from. I already kind of told you at, at the beginning. Oh, Wet and Wild Riptide number one. I know you guys have been waiting for that. As well as the Glory and Friends Bikini Fest. Fuck's sake, guys. Come on. All right. So that is Blood Pool number one. So this was another one of the issues that I bought uh, in that second wave of image books I was picking up where I was thinking, okay, like, what if I get a bunch of number ones that I've never heard of and see how they go about building a team? And then I read through this and I'm like, so it doesn't matter how you build a team. Okay, good to know. Because in terms of story, this is some fucking bullshit. Bloodpool gets kicked out. Bloodpool leaves. Bloodpool steps in on hostage situation. And Bloodpool gets hired. And in the meantime, the writer refuses to write a script for pages at a time. I do kind of wish I knew what the fuck happened there. There is four issues of this, eh? I wonder if the other ones have that same problem. I don't see, like, panels at a time with no dialogue balloons, where it looks like stuff should be happening. So something was up with that first issue that wasn't doesn't seem to have been up in the second one. Which probably means there won't be a revisit video for Blood Pool number two, because uh, the weird schism between the writer and artist was definitely the most interesting thing going on in this particular comic. The art was usually pretty not bad. You know what part of the problem was also? Is that we get a lot of panels with no separation like you know no gutters so again everything just kind of bleeds together sometimes these are these are a little bit better but um yeah there's a lot of overlap anyway yeah that's a fucking mess it's interesting because i mean i figured like when i started into it like man a comic by joe duffy and a dude who obviously knows how to draw and just needs to get some pages under his belt that should go for a while bloodpool goes for four issues and then there's that special, and then it, it's never heard from again. So yeah, very strange. I gotta do some research and see if I could find what the fuck happened. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notifications so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. That'll give you access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions, and you can join the Blood Force Discord server. But yeah, that'll do it. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.